about who I was. What? 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 I went to go take care of me and my mom. I went to go take care of an old lady. So we didn't want to see her when she didn't want to open the door. She didn't know who we were, so we kind of just left and called the mess. Yeah. Yeah, what are you going to do, provoker? <laughs> Go ahead, shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. You just got showed up right there? The date. Oh, it's the same. Anybody else? Nobody else? Yes? I went to the ranch, and uh, I was actually really there. I had a really good service. So it was a little shocker? Saturday? Uh, on Sunday. Really? On Saturday. 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 Uh, Sunday. Was oh. Wasn't there another power outage? Was there? Yeah. There was one in the morning while you were here on Friday. Yeah, on state. I was talking about that. Yeah. Um, there, there was one. Oh, Cap had a wedding on Saturday. What? There was one on Saturday. There was another one on Saturday? Mm -hmm. Dang. I kind of thought they'd figured all that out. Because I want to make sure my daughter's photo doesn't get stepped on. Anybody else? No other amazing dramas? Amazing accomplishments? Spectacular shaka? Anybody get lobsters? Other than me? Where did you try? Wait, and your hope was to take them out of the tracks? Yeah, the poaching? That's what we were asked to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm <laughs> That's a really expensive lobster. <laughs> if, you, if you get caught for that, it's like so much money. And you're just crying. Yeah. There's a door with a little bungee. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you don't want to put it in the. Right. Isn't the lobster up to like 23 a pound now? $23 a pound? I think wholesale is coming in right around twenty a pound. I don't know what I don't know what retail is. Anybody bought lobster? I wouldn't know, bro. I get mine for free. What's <laughs> I went I went lobster fishing last night. How'd it go? It was slow, really slow. We only got two in like three hours. I barely got any sleep at all, so I'm like Where'd you go? Yeah, I've why, do you, why do you go at night? Because they're much more active at night. They walk at night, so they don't go creeping. Trapping. Hoop up. Anyway, that was fine. Okay. No more drama, no more amazing accomplishments. We're used to doing schoolwork. Fine, you leave me no choice but to educate. Did we talk about the boreal forest last time? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did we say that it's called taiga? Yeah. Did we talk about why the trees grow so straight? No. Ah. Good. Anytime during the day, and anytime during the year, if you're standing at the equator, the sun is directly over you. See that? But if you're standing towards the top, the sun comes pretty darn sideways. You already got that? You sure? Yep. You want to look again? Look, wherever you are, the sun's coming at you kind of sideways. If you're up at the top, any time of the year, see how it's like coming on kind of like angular at the top? So, trees that live here near the middle, they go like that. They get more sunlight because the sun's overhead. But trees that live up toward the poles, if they do this, all the light just goes like in one arm and out the other, so to speak. So trees that are closer to the poles, they grow like this, sideways. Because the light comes in sideways. And put a flashlight over your head and you're trying to catch that light, you wouldn't spread your arm. But if I put the light at you sideways, then you go like this. Does that make sense, everybody? So these trees, they run for the sky. They don't really need to 
to spread out very far. They just need to catch more light than their neighbors because their neighbors are trying to shade them. So uh, these trees, competitively, are racing each other. To be the only one, like, at the top. Of the yep, to be emergent, they call that. So if you look at these trees, like, more than half of their uh, chlorophyll is in the top, like, 15% of tree height. A lot of them will just grow, like, nude trunks and just have, like, a little tuft right at the top where they can hope to get some light away from their competitors. And because they grow with such abundant water and such a vertical competitive drive, they are straight and tall and spongy. Softwood, good for building stuff. You must know, softwood, good for building stuff. Straight and light. If you cut up these trees, that'd be really nice to build a house with. BT dubs, that's probably what your house is built out of. So this part of the world, where people don't usually like to live, is where we always like... She said the verification form would be somewhere in there, but she doesn't put it in there, so... Okay. That was just your entire mailbox. Thanks. What about the other one? Maybe the other one? Oh, she's going to email it. This is not impacted from people living there, by the way. When people live up there, they don't really like to do anything. It's not a place where people have a big impact directly. But they do have a gigantic impact by logging there. Lots and 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 lots of logging. Hey, I just got my AP scores back. My students AP scores. Yeah. Okay. All right, here we go. This part, please look up. It's hard to define what makes a biome sometimes, because you could say, hey, look, those trees are a little taller. That's different. Somebody else would go, oh, you know, but you're kind of in the same part of town. That's the same. And he could be like, yeah, but this little corner is really dry, so we'll call it the dry corner of the biome. And just so you know, some books say there's five biomes. Some say eight, some say seven, some say nine, some say 17. You know, like somebody could say the dry extreme and the wet extreme. So watch this. The picture in your book uses the same color for three biomes. Please look up. Temperate woodland, deciduous forest, and rainforest. They're all temperate right in here. If they're really, really wet, then we call those the temperate rainforest. If they're really, really dry, we call them temperate woodland. And if they're kind of in the middle, we call it temperate deciduous forest. So we're going to do temperate deciduous forest first. If you look up here, see that light, light green? That's the temperate deciduous forest. Sorry, that's the temperate forest. The one in like East North America? Yeah, the deciduous stuff is the East North America stuff. Yep. Split like that? Yeah. Orange peel. So, yeah, orange peel. Orange peel. Uh, this was round. So to make it, like, if you look at the map right behind Sam Ruggieri's head, as Sam moves out of the way for us. Thanks, buddy. Uh, you'll notice that that map is a rectangle, right? So look at how big, like, the northern land masses look. But obviously, you know that that's a, it's a sphere, right? So the equator is like this. At the top, it's a lot smaller, right? The ring is smaller at the top. 
So you can either stretch that up, stretch that out to make it a rectangle, or you can cut it up like an orange peel. You dig? So this is considered a rounded projection of the map. Rounded in the sense that when you piece that all together, there's no distortion in the land masses, right? Like an orange peel. This one, if you roll it up, you would get a cylinder, not a circle, right? So to close up that circle, you have to actually compress the northern latitudes. Like people are wider on that map at the top. That's my excuse. I come from the polar regions. So it's like those maps aren't really to scale. They are to a scale. But not, not like, they're not represent, like Africa on that map is not nearly as big as That's right. like Africa on that That's map. correct. You are bingo. Okay, here we go. <coughs> Temperate deciduous forest is the place that you would want to be. The temperate world has seasons. These are real seasons. Because, you know, temperate, that's like from 30 to 60. So that's like a pretty significant difference in day length. The shortest day compared to the longest day, they're probably three or four hours apart in day length. The longest day is about four hours longer than the shortest day. The winter can be like a real winter, like snow and stuff. And that's kind of harsh. But spring, summer, and fall, those are usually pretty doable. Kind of nice even. It usually rains in all four of those seasons. Plants here, they just sort of take a break. That's why they call them deciduous, because they drop their leaves. It's like, well, I'm not going to need these for a little while. They just drop their leaves. And wood here is hard, hard woods. Um, would anybody like to try my, my water holding challenge? One person. I'll try. You were just hand first. <laughs> These have roughly the same volume of water, but yours is in plastic, mine is in glass. You have to hold this out. Okay. You lock your arm? Okay. And you're not allowed to drop that. Okay? You're not allowed to like drop your arm. Okay. Now First of all, the deciduous thing. Anybody know why the leaves are red? They have no chlorophyll. They have no chlorophyll. And he said no chlorophyll left, and that's actually accurate. They're always red. The green, the chlorophyll, that just covers up the red. See, these trees, when they notice that the days are getting shorter, it's like, well, this won't take long. Rather than trying to survive this cold, snowy, crappy winter, they say, you know what, I'm just going to pull out for a little while. They just take the chlorophyll out from the leaves, showing the leaves, quote unquote, true colors, the red. There's that season where all of the leaves fall. Anybody know what you call that season where all the leaves fall? Fall. <laughs> <laughs> you get that beautiful changing of the colors. But we're here to demonstrate why that wood is called hardwood. How are you feeling? That's so great. Kind of great, right? Yeah. Yeah. By sixth period, I don't even try anymore. I just make other kids do it. <laughs> we're trying to see who can hold this the longest. What is this show? That we are wimps. <laughs> we're going to tell them something. Uh, how much longer do you think you can do that? Uh, a couple more minutes. Couple of minutes, really? I'm almost done, dude. I'm getting ready to pass out. <laughs> my heart. Really? You got minutes? I'm probably not. No. Whoa! Well, look at how beautiful that place is. 
Now in the spring, they'll come back. They'll come back nice and green and strong. Because they put all that mulch into the ground, all that decomposition was happening, the snow melt, got the leaves tearing apart. <laughs> struggling. Okay, you struggling? Look, I'm, I'm literally quaking right now. <laughs> Look at that. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> it's going down. I'm gonna drop a big old glass bottle on my foot. This is gonna hurt. Okay. 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 I remember in the winter they truly shut down, but imagine underneath there. I'm gonna have to put this down. Oh. <laughs> what do I get if I would? Oh God! God! I need my left hand. I'm right-handed. Oh, this is so hard! <laughs> oh! No! Ah, I don't want to put it down! Get rid of the catch, I want to go. Oh, I, oh, I don't really want it. No, get out of oh, okay. here. Okay. Good job. Oh, my God. It's oh, heavy. It's heavy. How long do we hold that? Two minutes. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> like two minutes. Anybody know what I wanted to demonstrate right there? No. <laughs> what? How strong trees are. Glass is heavy. How strong trees are, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're demonstrating how strong these trees are, because they grow like this. And they can support that weight forever, full of snow even. In the rain, when those leaves get wet, and they're all like little parachutes catching rainfall, they can support that. In the wind, when they're blowing sideways, they can support that. See, it wouldn't be any challenge to just sit here and hold it down like this. And as a matter of fact, you might be surprised to know that it's not much of a challenge to sit here and hold it straight over your head. This, I'm sure we could do for five or six. <laughs> But this one, holding it out, that's really difficult. See here, because we're getting more direct sunlight, many, many trees start to spread outward. So trees that grow outward tend to have hard woods. The deciduous forest has the most seasonality of the temperate area. So because it's the most seasonal of the temperate area, the trees take a time out, they drop their leaves, survive this winter with a layer of insulation like socks on their feet to keep their roots healthy, to keep the soil alive, to trap moisture. And then when that snow melts, everything decomposes in the ground, and that water feeds them their nutrients that they left on the ground the previous fall. Coincidentally, this is a very heavily impacted biome, because it's a really <laughs> nice place to live. Um, I think a lot of you realize that Europeans came from this biome and did really well in the United States colonially because um, the United States was a very similar biome. The, the colonies were a very similar biome. Now, remember I told you there's two extremes here? The extremely wet is called temperate rainforest. It's the same latitudes, but near a jet stream. So you've got the Pacific Northwest. You all, you all see where like Seattle, Vancouver, uh, Oregon, Mendocino, Humboldt, Washington. Washington, that whole coastal stretch, Pacific Northwest. Also Japan, does everybody recognize Japan? Little tiny islands over there in the North Pacific across from Canada. And then you've got a little bit down here. You guys going to Canada? Yeah. I love Canada. I'm going to soccer. Where? Uh, 
Vancouver is the most beautiful city in the world. <laughs> they do? Mm -hmm. You're lucky, so are they. I love Vancouver. It rains there. Yeah. <laughs> I love rain. I come from a part of rain where it used to rain like a lot. I have a memory of it raining nonstop for 30 days, and that can't be right, but I have a memory of it raining nonstop for 30 days. <laughs> So I miss the rain. I love Vancouver. That's a beautiful town. I wanted to go to grad school in Vancouver at UBC. It didn't work out. So look, New Zealand is one of these temperate rainforests. And that coast of Chile, Chile and Patagonia, and even a little tiny bit on the Argentina side, see that southern tip of South America that's got that light green? These are all really wet parts of the world because they get like tremendous coastal storms in that temperate biome. This has more moderate temperature because they're near sea level. So they're not very seasonal. It's just wet and moderate temperatures nonstop. Wet and moderate temperatures. So you get um, like fairy fantasy wonderland with like ferns and really big trees and lots of rivers with lots of water. <coughs> You've got like that boreal temperature range. Not quite. I should change that. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know. say about this, it's temperate, so it has like some seasonality, but the temperatures are actually relatively mild because it's near sea level. Um, I have a homie in town that climbs the world's tallest trees. He'll find like the number one tallest Douglas fir and he'll go climb it. And he'll find like the number one tallest giant yellow fir and he'll go climb it. Of all the tallest individuals of species in the United States, he's climbed more than half. So like where the tallest of a species is in the US, he's climbed more than half of them. That's like his hobby. He, like, goes on these crazy excursions and like gets up these trees that are super darn hard. Yeah. Does he ever fall like from really high? I I mean He's uh, he's a he's a professional arborist, so he has all the gear and he knows how to how to rig. I'm sure he's fallen, but I'm sure that he's um, secured when he falls. Like climbing, usually there's like a conceptually the same concept of you know, like the way that you protect a fall. Yeah. So I I don't know about that because the tallest redwood tree is a secret. I don't think you're allowed to climb those. Like you are not allowed to climb the tallest sequoia. Wait, which one's the Well, like, isn't there like Redwood National Park or something? Wait, what? Why is it a little there? Are, there are several redwoods. Yeah, I mean, I, I know he's been in top ten redwoods. Wait, why? But he's been in in several of the top ten redwoods. I don't know if he's been in the tallest redwood. It's in um. It's in Redwood National Forest. Which is like a downhill of the Sequoia National Park. Like below, I think it's in the King River Basin, maybe? Isn't it named something grand? Oh, you're thinking of uh, the largest sequoias. Oh, yeah. sequoia. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, big old trees, a lot of rain. And the Pacific Northwest had one really important um, uh, trivia species. One that's like really, really famous. Anybody know what this is? That owl. owl. Yes, but what kind of owl? Great a great small owl. owl. It's a spotted owl. You can see because it's got spots. And uh, you're all you're all much too young to know about this, but. Uh, 
The spotted owl was like the focus of one of the most vicious political battles for environmental reasons. Um, in the 1980s, the Pacific Northwest had like a waning lumber economy. The lumber world was kind of like struggling to stay in business. And at the same time, this owl was listed as endangered, and it only lives in the Pacific Northwest, and they're very impacted by logging, because they only live in forests that are purely silent. If they hear noises, they will abandon their nest. And you probably realize that logging is kind of a loud business, like the chainsaws and the tractors and the chippers and the grinders and stuff. And so there was like a really bitter battle with uh, some people in government saying, oh, we need to tear down the EPA, we need to get rid of the Endangered Species Act. Um, and of course, all the conservationists say, these things are like really rare and stuff, and we need to protect them. There we go. Wasn't there a movie about that? I remember a movie from my childhood with like the owls living in the holes and they wanted to... Oh. <laughs> it's called a boot or something. Oh. Oh, that was about the that was about the burrow. Oh, <laughs> yeah, the burrow. Yeah, yeah, is that burrowing owls? Okay. Yeah, there was one. Okay. Can't remember the name of it. Yeah, me either. If I had a better spray bottle, I'd be hosing you for talking the whole time for two years. <laughs> I'm holding this bottle and dumping it on your head. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, spot it out. Classic conservation versus uh, economy topic. Uh, again, this, this area is super heavily impacted by logging, and it's a really small biome anyway. Remember that it's either its own biome or kind of a biome. It's like the wet part of a biome. Then the dry extreme is temperate woodland, and this is like the southern part of the green. Like here, please look up. Here in the U.S. south. Here near the Mediterranean, and here near the grasslands of China. Is that that's not China? Is it? No. What is this? That's China. That's really China. Yeah. We're like close to China. No, that's China. I got very little to say about this one. It's just the dry extreme of temperate forest. That looks some lumber. What? That looks exactly like the backyard of my grandma's house in the valley. Like, okay. like the exact trail. Nice. Maybe this is from your grandma's house. Maybe. I love this. <laughs> yeah. um, so a lot of people don't even consider this a biome. It's known for its lumber. But we're moving on to the one that we really want to talk about, which is yours. So about shrubland. First of all, many names to this. People call it temperate shrubland, chaparral, temperate woodland. People call it dwarf woodland, Mediterranean. You gotta know at least those names. Yep. Oh, okay. No, no, no. Sorry. Oh. Some people call this temperate woodland, but oh. we're not here. Oh. Oh. <laughs> and look at this neat pattern. It's the dark red stuff. It's on what? <coughs> it's on the coast. Yeah, number one, we are coastal, but number two, which coastal? Those are all west coast. Notice all five. And which latitude? They're all the exact same latitude. It's exactly 35. The dead center is 36. Those are that, yeah, at 35? Uh, yeah, 35. Notice that they're all like perfectly centered at 35. 
They're all west coast. They're all pretty small. <clears throat> and by the way, that's where most of Santa Barbara's really gnarly invasive species come from. Like, have you guys heard of Arundel grass? That comes from the Chilean red spot. Have you heard of ice plant? Mm -hmm. yeah. That comes from the South African red spot. That's the stuff all near the bike path down there. Right. Down there. Yeah. Nope. It's Super invasive. Yeah. <laughs> ice plant. Ice plant. Because it's invasive, it does really well here. Why are they called ice plant? Because you bring them open, they feel cold on the inside. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know those eucalyptus like we have on Eucalyptus Hill? They're from the Australian red spot. Many of the animals that are invasive in the United States, uh, sorry, in Santa Barbara, many of our invasive animals come from either the South American red spot or the European red spot. Does it make sense to you, this is so noteworthy, I even forgot to mention it earlier, that invasives have to go from one biome to another continent, same biome? Yeah, yeah it makes different biomes. That makes sense, right? You gotta stay within your biome, but go to a different continent. Like if you brought a polar bear to Santa Barbara, it would not become invasive. <laughs> if you like release penguins in the Mojave Desert, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> but like, we have a, a type of dove that comes from the Eurasian, one of these, that's now living in California, and they're going nuts. They love it here. Because it's like the same weather, but they don't have the other competition, the other predators. You remove some of their limiting factors, but you put them within their tolerance limits. So how do we describe our weather? Do you live here? Okay. Sunny, temperate, dry, what else? Super hot. Super hot. Right now. Right now. Like right now, now. yeah. Right now. Yeah. 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 I mean, I was like this for like So actually, that's a fine complaint. Okay, show it for me. He says it's really hot. She says that's just like one week. And that's actually a really important characteristic of our weather. Anybody know how we would describe this in science terms? There's no season. Inconsistent. We are super temperate with short extremes. So our average temperature is like 73 degrees and like 85% of the day, 85% of the days, are 73 degrees. You'll get like a little cold snap and a little heat wave, but then it goes back to being 73 degrees. I had a week in February where it was below freezing on Sunday, over 100 degrees on Wednesday, and below freezing the next Sunday. Yep. Yeah. yeah, when I was in Canada, it would be like 85, 90 degrees out, and the next day it would be daylight. Same thing. That's fairly extreme. There's not quite as much extreme. Yeah, in Colorado, one, like during the day it was hot, and then it snowed, like even just later on in the day, not even at night, so yeah. it started snowing just randomly. We have some extremes, but even our extremes are actually just like little hits of like a little extreme. What about our rainfall? Not very much. Non existent. <laughs> well, it depends. It's like seasonal. It's like, like a cool season. Is it like, uh, maybe it's like, is there like sometimes there's a lot of rainfall? We have very rare storms, and usually they have a lot of volume. So we have infrequent large rains. Especially in the mountains, you know, like the, the annual rainfall here in the city of Santa Barbara is like, what, 20 inches or something? I was guessing. But I used to live on West Camino Cielo. Anybody here live like Trout Club, West Camino, East Camino, Painted Cave? So you know what I'm talking about. When we get a rain up there, like, there was a year, how long have you been living? Where, where do you live? I live in Trout Club. Trout Club? How long have you been living there? Like six years. 
So you were there right after the 154 washed out at the intersection? So like seven or eight years ago, right before he moved up there, we had a, a, a winter where it rained over 260 inches, mm -hmm. which is better than the average for the Amazon basin. <laughs> Our mountains, they get dumps. And so when that comes down the rivers, everybody's seen Santa Barbara flood, right? Because this place is like bone dry, Really, really paved over here in the lowlands, but those mountains up there, they're like 2,000 plus, and they pick up a lot of rainfall during those rainstorms. So when you're getting rain here, and everybody's like, oh my god, it's raining, up there it rains really hard. And you've experienced this, I'm sure, in the last six years, right? Yeah, it, um, my, my house, West Camino Cielo, would get like, um, like snow sticking at least an hour, um, like every other year or so. I lived up there like 11 years, and that happened at least five or six times I can remember. One time we actually built like little snowboard kickers on my driveway. I tried doing that the first time I skied, went off it, and my just both of them just stuck into the snow, and I face planted this forward. That's pretty funny. I did that on a snowboard once. And I broke two of my ribs because my head hit my binding. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> and I broke two ribs. <laughs> yeah, that hurt really bad. And I already had a broken thumb that day. <laughs> Look, this is Santa Barbara vegetation right here. Like, welcome to Santa Barbara. This is like so characteristic. Anybody know what um, chaparro means in Spanish? I think it's like slang in Mesoamerica. What? Short. Short, yeah. It means like, uh, like people often say that for like little kids or like groms get called chaparro. Um, chaparral means like a lot of dwarf things or a lot of small things. It's a dwarf forest. Most of these things are very many years old, but you can see they're really dense and really low to the ground. Chaparral means dwarf forest. And the reason our plants are so dwarf is because they can't afford to spread out. When you spread out, you dry out. And our area is extremely dry. We have longer dry spells than most deserts. When people leave Santa Barbara, they're always surprised to find that in most parts of the world, it rains during the summer. Not a lot. Not like systems of rain for like six days of rain. But every day you get like a little spritz in the summertime. Not here. Here you'll get the last rain in like April or May, and the first rain in like October-ish. We've had seven months without a drop of rain in Santa Barbara, many times. That's really, really dry. I don't know if you've noticed, but when people try to grow cactus, if you don't irrigate them, they die here. Are you aware of that? A lot of people, I've, I've seen people do this all the time, They'll be like, hey, look, I got a cactus, and, you know, it's from the desert, so I can just leave it out, and it'll be fine. No, it will die. It needs to be watered a lot. In the desert, it rains. Hot days, you get thunderstorms. Here, hot days, it's just hot. That's it. Over and over and over, six, seven months in a row. When was the last time it rained here? I heard you got a little spritz in June or July. Yeah. 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 Do you remember what month that was? Was that July or June? June. June? June? No, I think it was... I feel like we had a little bit. Yeah, we had a little bit over summer. Yeah. <laughs> so this is your bio. I think most of what I said you already know. We have an extremely long dry summer. Extremely wet but rare storms. <clears throat> we'll get all of our rain in like six one-day events. Well, we're already in El Nino now. Um, but it looks like it's going to fall apart before we get into the rainy season. Does not seem like it will last. There is a hurricane. Yeah, but those aren't, those are evidence of existing El Nino um, in the Pacific at large. 
They're not the pattern of El Nino that helps us get out of a drought. What helps us is when we have um, a lot of humidity in the jet stream, and so then the big jet stream rains come to us. That's when we get those big rains like I was talking to Bobro about. And it looks like um, the part of the Pacific that fuels our rainstorms is mostly back to normal. It's like an average year. Okay. So you think we're going I think we're going to have roughly normal rain, yeah. Unfortunately. How do you think the snow season is going to be? Um, I think the snow season is going to be pretty bad. Okay. Our plants are extremely dense. They're low to the ground. And they have something special. Have you ever heard of a local artist named Chris Potter? Chris Potter's a friend of mine. He's a, a plein air artist, meaning uh, he takes his easel outdoors and just like paints, like views and stuff. And he does that every day. And uh, he makes a decent amount of money as an artist. Is he kind of older? Dude? Yeah, he's like my age, if you consider that older. No, I'm thinking of like <coughs> 60s. No, 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 not that old. Yeah, I see this one guy sit down by the skate park with his easel and paint the, the coast a lot. Oh, well, my homie Chris does that sort of thing. He usually doesn't sit, he stands to paint. But anyway, he, I was hanging with him this weekend, and uh, he was painting at El Cap. And he did this painting looking up the coast, so it was like sunrise behind him, and he was like watching the hills looking up the Gaviota coast. He was painting that. And when he paints our mountains, he uses a really special color. He says, you know, this is only in Santa Barbara that I do this. Anybody notice how that color looks different? That's like so classic Santa Barbara, right? Can you just tell by looking at it? It's definitely Santa Barbara. Green. Yeah, it's gray. It's gray because our plants get, first of all, super dusty, and second of all, they're very waxy. Anybody know why they would be waxy? Yeah, it's keep the water in. Everybody knows what happens when you put uh, wax on a surfboard, right? Mm -hmm. Like, the water just spills off. You can just, like, flow it off. Because water doesn't like wax. So by the leaves having wax on the outside, the water can't get through. So wax is a way that they can keep all their stuff. But, of course, wax gets kind of sticky. So dust will stick to them, and they get really gray like that. Something else that's neat about our, <coughs> about our forest, we are what's called, please look up, a fire renewal community. What fire renewal community means is that a lot of our plants are evolved to take advantage of the nutrients you get after a fire. You see, how's our soil here in this bio? Anybody have any experience with our native soil? Full of nutrients. Yeah, the exact opposite. We don't even have soil. <laughs> like. If you try to dig a hole in Santa Barbara, anybody ever try to use like a shovel to like dig a hole somewhere? I don't know how hard that is, but you get anywhere? Like maybe along the stream on like really steep slopes, sometimes you can make like some piles of dirt that you can dig a hole sometimes, maybe a little bit sometimes. But if you get to like open flat areas, we don't do soil here. Our plants don't grow and decompose and grow and decompose and grow and decompose. They just grow a little bit and then they dry out. And they just wait. Like, have you ever seen sage? Sage goes, oh yeah, it rained! And it shoots out all these flowers. And like a week later it's like, but I'm dead again. <laughs> so, we don't have regular growth and deposition and decomposition. We don't have enough rain to keep decomposers going. We don't do topsoil. 
We have really shallow, nutrient-poor, sandy soil. So seeds have to be really specially adapted. Plants make lots and lots and lots of seeds here. And also, a lot of those seeds will take advantage of the fertilizer you get when the rain washes the ashes after a fire. How many of you have been hiking in our hills after a fire, one of the fire zones, like two, three years later? How did those areas look to you? Really burned. So first they get all black, ashy. What about a couple years later? Then what does it look like? It's like you still see occasional burning plants. There's a lot of like, green, like green I know, It looks pretty like almost it looks like a fire renewal community. Yeah. <laughs> fire renewal is kind of a way to recycle. You've got all this stuff locked up and dried up, horrible, dusty looking Santa Barbara scruff. And when you burn all that, it's back to fertilizer in the ground because those ashes are just a bunch of nutrients and then the water will put that all back into new growth. That's what fire renewal community means. And this is a perfect example. <coughs> so when we flower, we flower really big. And then we tough it out and wait for the rain to go. Um, FYI, Santa Barbara has one um, <coughs> really interesting historical species here. One uh, interesting for political reasons species. Do you remember hearing about DDT and bald eagles? Did we talk about that in this class? Rachel Carson saw it in spring where the fertilizer would make the eggs weak. It would like go into the ocean, into the algae, into the fish, and the birds would eat the fish, and their eggs would be really squishy. Yeah. So that actually happened here in Santa Barbara. The Santa Inez River and the Ventura River had a lot of agriculture, and back in the day we used a lot of DDT. And that stuff went into our oceans. Rachel Carson studied this part of the world. And um, so our, our algae had a bunch of DDT in it. Unfortunately, the algae was eaten by plankton that had a bunch of DDT. And the little fish ate the plankton, and the big fish ate the little fish. And then the bald eagles ate the fish. And the DDT in the eagles makes their eggs really brittle, like soft and squishy. So when they're trying to lay the egg, it just gets like, it pops, you know? Or if they'll lay it successfully, they go to sit on it, and it just pops and it smushes. And when the bald eagles couldn't reproduce, they were replaced by these things called golden eagles. Bald eagles are big and tough, and they eat fish, and they sort of own their territory. But when those bald eagles leave or die, golden eagles move in. Golden eagles are smaller, scrawnier, and they eat mammals. And these things threatened a really special, rare species that only lives on the islands, the Dwarf Island Fox. It's a long story. Someday maybe you'll hear it all. Um, the bottom line is, though, that our area has been really, really, really famous and really, really important because we've seen a lot of these ecological changes happen here because the first university to study environmental science was ours. We've sort of like written the book on a lot of the big topics in this class. Like... Uh, uh, ecosystem shifts, what invasive species replace native species, and stuff like that. Or were the golden eagles like invasive, or were they just able to fill the gap that the... Uh, that yeah, the I think species. that might be a better way to say it. I think you said it better than I did. Yeah, I think that they were just better able to fill the gap. Okay. That's probably the better way to say that. Okay. Um... I guess we've already talked about all of that. And check this out. Look at the numbers. I find these numbers to be really interesting. You live in possibly the rarest biome. Very possibly the rarest biome. We didn't have a lot to begin with, and people love living here, as I'm sure you've, know, as I'm sure you've heard. So because we've used up a lot of a really little biome, 
There's probably less square mileage of this biome than any other. This, this may be the rarest biome by square mileage. This is why I always get so uppity when people start talking about developing our coastline and stuff. There's so few miles left of this area. Anyway, I want to stop here. Um, anything I left out? Anybody want to ask me anything? Talk biomes at all? Yes? What is the uh, UCSB picture? We're going to go look at habitat restoration sites. We'll talk about restoration later this week, and then we're going to go visit some really awesome, it's a beautiful trip. We spend all day like walking around UCSB, Galita area. Um, so do we miss school then? Yeah, you miss period one through five. So you can make zero and you can make six. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have lunch on the beach. We take a picnic out there. And, like, Sweet. That's this following Monday. Yeah, cool. and we can do that. I'll, I'll get that paper as soon as the bus company confirms. But yeah, they're like horrible humans that won't destroy everything else. I hate everybody there.